Hello, everybody. Are you all here? Are there any questions from previous lecture? Are there any questions? Yes, Shubha, you can go ahead. So, good morning, and we can start with Shubham's question. Yeah. So Shubham is asking uh, why in the simplified analysis of the white dwarf problem, we didn't take protons kinetic energy due to uncertainty principle, both case, not only for the non-relativistic case, but also for the relativistic case, we only considered the kinetic energy term arising due to uncertainty principle only for electrons. Okay. And the reason is very simple. Consider the non-relativistic case first. In the non-relativistic case, the proton's kinetic energy arising due to uncertainty principle will be delta P square divided by twice proton mass. But proton mass is 2000 times electron's mass, while delta P square will be related to the inverse of the average separation between the proton-proton or the proton-electron or electron-electron. The average separation is same for electrons as well as protons. And hence, delta P square will be identical while the 2Me is much, much small compared to 2MP. And therefore, the kinetic energy term for the electron will dominate over the kinetic energy term for the proton arising out of the uncertainty principle. 
Let's consider the uncertainty kinetic energy term when your electrons are relativistic. Remember, electrons being very light, even when the average separation is not too small, electrons can become relativistic. But protons will not because protons mass is very large. Remember the uh, term E square equal to P square C square plus M square C4. When M is very large, energy is dominated by the rest, rest energy. All right. And therefore, the energy due to momentum when the rest mass is very large is insignificant. And therefore, for protons, E square will be almost identical to M square C4, even when we take uncertainty into account. And therefore, delta E will be almost zero because M square C4 or delta E will be delta M C square. But delta M is zero because there's no uncertainty in the mass. So I hope uh, I have clarified the issue concerning why in both cases we only considered the kinetic energy arising out of uncertainty principle only for electron. Protons uh, kinetic energy due to uncertainty principle is negligible compared to the electrons case. Yeah, Shubham is asking uh, why equation 19 also takes into account the stability consideration for the case of white dwarf. Let me go to that slide. Yeah, so uh, I'm just trying to find out which is equation 19. Uh, I guess it is the energy arising due to uncertainty principle. Now, uh, what I had in the previous lecture argued was since the energy for a bound system must be negative. And if the, let me try to get that term, yeah, let me go to equation 19. Yes, if, as you can see in equation 19, the energy for the relativistic electrons plus protons, there is a kinetic energy term arising due to uncertainty principle, which is HC multiplied by cube root of 3m by 4 pi mp. And there is a potential energy term minus G capital M multiplied by the proton mass. Now clearly, if the minus gm mp is larger, that means gm mp is larger than the kinetic energy term arising due to uncertainty principle, your energy is going to be negative. But there is a 1 over r overall. What does it tell you? 
that if the potential energy term dominates, that means whatever is there in the square bracket is negative and you have 1 over r, r multiplying that expression, then your energy can become more and more negative if r becomes smaller and smaller. In other words, this expression tells me, after all, in all processes, the white dwarf will be radiating away. So its energy can become more and more negative. And therefore, if the potential energy term dominates, then by shrinking, the energy can become more and more negative. And hence, it is reflecting an instability. The white dwarf will not be stable. It just keep on shrinking till R goes to zero. Clearly, this is unstable because it's just shrinking. There's no stability. While if the kinetic energy term is which is positive and it is larger than GMMP, then of course it is positive. And in which case it will not like to reduce in size because then it becomes more positive. It can try to expand. That's all. But that will be the case where uh, it is unbound. So if you want to have a system which is marginally stable, that can happen only if the quantity in the square bracket in equation 19 is zero. Okay. Yeah, Shubham, uh, uh, because I was not sharing that slide, therefore it is not on the screen, but I'm sure you have the PDF that I sent uh, by mail uh, with you and equation 19, I just discussed the argument. Remember, it is a simplified argument and it is not the analysis that Chandrasekhar had done. Chandrasekhar had done uh, a full-fledged analysis taking a realistic star whose equation of state for a relativistic electron degenerate gas was uh, given by pressure proportional to the density to the power four-third. And he had done a full-fledged proper calculation. What I indicated is a simplified version which is motivated by Landau's uh, simplified analysis. All right. Are there any other questions? Okay, if there are no further questions, I will go ahead with the uh, lecture and continue for from where I start, uh, where I had ended. One moment, it is uh, uploading the file due to some reason the system is quite slow.
notice that I had asked you one question in my second assignment set that why are the white dwarfs appearing to be fewer in number compared to the high mass stars and similarly compared to the red giants why are the number of red giants so small compared to the main sequence stars of the same mass you, you have to just give qualitative argument reason it out and uh, give qualitative argument Right. So, uh, uh, what I had mentioned about white dwarf is that once the core of the star, the nuclear fusion stops, it shrinks, and when it shrinks, what happens is you you have the carbon, oxygen, nitrogen atoms inside the core, and once there is no heat production, and therefore the core shrinks when the core shrinks the atoms come close to each other and when they come very very close to each other the electrons surrounding the atoms they don't know to which nucleus the electrons belong and if you further compress the matter then the nucleus positivity charged nucleus they form a mass with electrons forming a C in which the positive charge particles are embedded. And that is the reason why the C of electrons, when the density becomes very high, since they don't belong to any particular positively charged nucleus, the C of electrons are called degenerate. And because we are talking about electrons being degenerate in the sense that they don't belong to a particular nucleus. We say that you have a degenerate electron gas and as we uh, saw in the last class that the uncertainty principle because of the fact that the typical separation between the electron is very small so uncertainty the momentum is very large and therefore, the kinetic energy due to uncertainty principle is very large, which plays an important role in the white dwarf uh, matter. But that was a simplified consideration. But what one has to talk about in a realistic consideration is talk about the electrons being identical fermions. And because of that, in the gravitational potential, you can only populate a single electron in one given quantum state because they are fermions. And you cannot put more electrons having the same quantum state. And that is the reason more the number density, the Fermi energy, that means the highest energy of the collection of fermions, they increase. And therefore, if you try to compress, the Fermi energy level goes up. That means for compression, you need more energy, which is equivalent to having a repulsive force whenever you try to compress the system. And it is this repulsive force, which is causing the outward pressure that balances the gravity. And what Chandrasekhar showed was that for relativistic electrons, once the mass of the total system, that means gravitational potential, becomes very, very negative, even the relativistic degenerate electron gas pressure will not be able to keep the white dwarf in equilibrium. And what Chandrasekhar showed was that the radiation of the star will keep going down 
as mass increases remember even in the case fowler's analysis had shown that r is proportional to 1 over q q root of mass what chandrashekhar showed was when you have relativistic electron degenerate pressure then the mass has an upper limit it cannot because the radius goes to zero when mass is about 1.4 solar mass so beyond 1.4 solar mass there are no white dwarfs right now let us come to the case for a high mass star and for a high mass star if the core mass is less than 2.5 to about 3 solar mass then the core can collapse to become a neutron star and the outer envelope explodes as a supernova so in a very high mass star what happens is that as the thermonuclear fusion progresses then typically for a 25 solar mass star the core first will burn and hydrogen will get converted to helium it will take about 7 million years then the helium will burn to form carbon which will take about 7 into 10 to 5 years then carbon will undergo thermo nuclear fusion to become oxygen 600 years now see how progressively the time period keeps going down because there is no energy source available so it, they are faster and faster the progress in is going on and then silicon becomes oxygen over 6 months and then silicon in the core turns to iron in one day and if the iron mass is greater than 2.5 to 3 solar mass then the iron core when it cools down will collapse gravitationally i have also given you a problem to estimate the collapse time scale and the iron core supposing the iron core mass is mc then total gravitational potential energy of the iron core mass is minus gmc square divided by rc where rc is the radius of the core okay so minus gmc square over rc is the gravitational potential energy and when it collapses to form a neutron star of radius either 10 kilometers or 15 kilometers minus gmc square by 10 kilometers is more negative than minus gmc square divided by let's say 1000 kilometers and the difference in the energy is what drives the supernova explosion and as i had mentioned in the previous lecture the energy 99% of the energy goes into neutrinos while about 1% goes in the mechanical energy that means the kinetic energy of the blast wave and there is a supernova explosion and the core of course bounces and becomes eventually a full fledged neutron star now i had mentioned to you that uh, landau had talked about neutron stars using chandrashekhar's argument but it seems 
uh, this story is not fully correct. The real story has been mentioned by uh, a very well-known stellar evolution theorist, Adam S. Burroughs, in his article, Bade and Zwicky, Supernovae, Neutron Stars and Cosmic Rays, in the Proceedings of National American Society, National Astronomical Society, 2015. And here is a link to the article. Please go to the link and you will find that what Landau had talked about using the Chandrasekhar's kind of argument is the formation of a giant nucleus. <coughs> Excuse me. Giant nucleus meaning uh, he talked about the protons and neutrons forming a degenerate gas and the whole star shrinks to the density of nucleus and a giant nucleus is formed as a result of it. He didn't talk about the neutron stars. That's what Adam S. Burroughs mentions. The concept of neutron star was actually provided by the astronomer Bade and Zwicky. Remember, Zwicky is also that famous astronomer who talked about dark matter to bring about the stability of clusters, in particular the coma cluster. What Bade and Zwicky they had done was there are certain rays called cosmic rays. For example, very high energy nuclei and electrons are observed on Earth when you have detectors spread around, like the detectors uh, of TIFR in Pachmadi or in uh, Uti or in Leh in Ladakh. They study the high energy cosmic rays coming from the Milky Way and some come from outside the Milky Way. What Bade and Zwicky, they in a very prescient paper had argued that supernovae, the, whenever there's a supernova collapse, the core collapses to a neutron star and the supernovae accelerates cosmic rays to such high energy. It was a very prescient paper and basic thesis of Bade and Zwicky turns out to be valid even today. And here is a picture of the crab pulsar. As you know, there is a crab nebulae. I will talk about, I'll show you a picture of the crab nebulae. At the center of crab nebulae, there is a neutron star which is rotating and therefore it acts as a pulsar. This is the Chandra image. Chandra is an X-ray telescope named after Jais Chandrasekhar and that X-ray telescope has observed the X-ray emission from the crab pulsar and see that there is evidence of rotation. Okay, now let's go to some of the supernovae uh, observed. So the last supernovae that was observed uh, from nearby was the supernovae 1987A. This is the shell, bright shell because of the explosion here. And uh, this happened in a uh, galaxy, disturbed galaxy called the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is very close by to our galaxy within 60 kiloparsec this large Magellanic cloud exists and there's a close-up view of the central region of the supernova explosion. This is the Crab Nebula and this Crab Nebula is a remnant of the supernova explosion and at the center there is a pulsar. Pulsar is nothing but a 
rotating neutron star with very high magnetic field and we know for sure that this supernova was observed from earth in the year 1054 ad why can we be so so sure that this supernova exploded as seen on earth in 1054 ad the reason is the chinese astronomers their records mention that in a given direction a guest a a a new star was born a bright star was visible in a particular direction and when later on astronomers looked at the direction they found the supernova remnant the so called crab nebula and also from the pulsar the age of the pulsar can be ascertained uh the characteristic age of the pulsar can be ascertained and it sort of agrees with the 10054 ad slightly less than 1000 years and the pulsar age also agrees with this kind of <clears throat> observation all right there are other supernovae too like for example kepler supernova remnant 1604 and this kepler supernova remnant can be seen not only in the visible but in the infrared part of the spectrum x ray part of the spectrum now uh, let me mention what is the infrared wavelength infrared wavelength is infrared radiation which is also part of the electromagnetic radiation the wavelength is greater than or equal to about 800 nanometers visible as you know visible part of the spectrum goes from 400 nanometer to about 750 to 780 nanometer uv spectrum is between few nanometers to about 380 nanometer x rays are high frequency radiation in energy units the x ray photons roughly goes from 900 or rather a uh, few kilo electron volts to about 900 kilo electron volts beyond that are the gamma rays so gamma ray photons have energy greater than million electron volts all right and this kepler supernova can be seen in infrared visible as well as x rays now let's come to the core of a supernova which as bade and zicky theorized that core will be a neutron rich star and because all stars rotate therefore core of a star also rotates and the when the core collapses angular momentum is conserved and therefore the rotation speed when it becomes a neutron star becomes faster because the neutron star radius is much much smaller than the radius initial radius of the core just like when we go to some science museum we are asked to sit on a rotating chair and we are asked to stretch our arms and then the chair is given a spin initially the chair might be spinning at a slower rate but when you 
bring your arms close to your chest the chair starts rotating fast because of the conservation of angular momentum and therefore even in the case of neutron star when the initial core radius is very large when it collapses to a small size the angular speed increases and all uh, cosmic objects also have magnetic field and therefore the pulsar because the core collapse and because of a result in which we can show that magnetic field times area of cross section is conserved because area of the cross section decreases from the initial core size to when it becomes say neutron star the magnetic field also gets amplified okay so here is a neutron star that rotates very fast and its magnetic field is also very intense and in general the magnetic field direction doesn't coincide with the rotation axis why because there is no reason why the bulk rotation should have any correlation with the plasma currents which generate the magnetic field all right and therefore we don't expect that the magnetic field must have the same direction as the rotation axis because of the fast rotation and the intense magnetic field an observer outside will see a changing magnetic field and therefore a very high electric field and these electric field accelerate electrons to produce pulses of radiation the trap pulsar every 0.33 second you see a double pulse arriving for a pulsar named psr 150958 you similarly have a single pulse for a vela pulsar also you have single pulse in radio these three pulsars are seen in radio optical x ray gamma rays and so on and the indian satellite astrosat which has multi wavelength telescopes on board has made very interesting observation of the crab pulsar those who are interested can see some of the papers published by the astrosat astrophysicists concerning the new observations of the pulses and the interpulse region of the crab pulsar so as i said that the the electric field will accelerate electrons and electrons will preferably move along the polar lines because across they can't move because of the lorentz force and the direction processing makes the beam of radiation process around the rotation axis and therefore pulsar acts as a cosmic lighthouse let's not go into the details of the pulsar radiation uh, but pulsars are a very fascinating uh, class of objects and many new physics are expected to come out of pulsar research here is the crab pulsar i had already showed you this is a chandra image of the crab pulsar this is a vela pulsar uh, observed by the chandra x ray observatory again here also you can see uh, the x ray image itself talk shows evidence of rotation and there's the axis of rotation also let me skip this uh, slide uh, only if there is a question i'll come back to the slide there are this other class of 
magnetized neutron stars which have been observed which have intense magnetic field these pulsars with magnetic field greater than 10 to the power 14 gauss they are called magnetars and these magnetars were discovered only in 1999 and they also form very exciting area of research now i will talk about some of the work that was done by saha and uh, because i'll be shifting a little bit the topic so let me ask if there are any questions so far okay i see so there is some problem i don't understand why my slides were not moving okay there seems to be a uh, bug uh let me let me come out and again uh, start sharing the slide yeah there seems to be a problem i don't know why when i go from one slide to another in the stream yard uh this is not happening
Yeah, there seems to be a problem. Uh, let me uh, stop the whole thing and restart. All right.
Yeah, now it seems to be all right. Okay. Yes, so I don't know what was wrong with it, some bug probably. Yeah, now I think everyone can see it, right? Okay, so uh, uh, let me again summarize uh, what I was mentioning. Right, so what I was talking about is that uh, when you compress the core to very high density, then the electrons around carbon, oxygen, etc., they become a sea of electrons with positively charged nuclei embedded in it. And that's the reason why the electrons, which are not now belonging to any particular nucleus, is called degenerate electrons. And these de degenerate electrons being fermions, they therefore must obey Pauli exclusion principle. And hence, in the gravitational potential of the core of the white dwarf, when you put the electrons in various levels, you can accommodate only one electron in every quantum state. <laughs> Excuse me. And hence, you can show that if the density of the electron increases, the electron must go into higher and higher energy level, the so-called Fermi energy level. And hence, if the density increases further, the Fermi energy level also goes up. In other words, gravitational contraction leads to higher and higher energy. And it is this higher energy resulting from Pauli exclusion principle which provides the outward force to counteract the gravitational collapse. But what Chandrasekhar had shown was that indeed, when the mass becomes greater than 1.4 solar mass, even this higher Fermi energy level rising because of compression will not be able to halt the collapse of the core. And Chandrasekhar showed that as the density goes beyond 1.4 solar mass, there is no solution. In fact, at 1.4 solar mass for stability, the radius of such a core must be zero. And therefore, there cannot be any white dwarf beyond 1.4 solar mass. Right. Now let's go on to the case of the core whose mass is greater than 1.4 solar mass. If it is greater, then of course, nuclear fusion will take place in which first 7 million years, hydrogen will become helium. Next 7 into 10 to the power 5 years, helium will become carbon, carbon to oxygen, oxygen to silicon. So for a very heavy core, one can go up to iron in the core. And then if the core iron mass is more than 1.4 solar mass, then the electron degener degeneracy pressure cannot support the iron core and it would start collapsing. And as I had talked about earlier, what happens is that when iron core of mass MC and radius RC, it 
the iron core mass is greater than 1.4 solar mass, then as Chandrasekhar showed, electron degeneracy pressure will not be able to counteract the gravitational uh, attractive force, it will collapse. So from an initial radius RC, it will let's say collapse to a radius 10 kilometers or 12 kilometers or 15 kilometers, depending upon the core mass. And hence, the gravitational potential energy of the core, initially it was minus GMC square divided by RC. Now it becomes minus GMC square divided by either 10 kilometers, 12 kilometers, so on. And therefore, the collapse core has a more negative gravitational potential energy than it had to begin with. And therefore, the difference in the energy is what results in the supernova explosion. In other words, when it is collapsing, the kinetic energy of the individual uh, iron nuclei will keep on increasing and they will collide with each other and the protons moving with great velocity will combine with electrons moving with great velocity and by virtue of the inverse beta decay, proton and electron will combine to form neutrons and neutrinos. And of course, the core will also undergo, collapsing core will undergo a bounce because when the neutrons, when the density becomes very high, the nuclear force equation becomes very stiff and there is a bounce both the neutrinos escaping as well as the bounce will impart energy to the outer envelope and the envelope will explode as a supernova. And neutrinos will carry 99% of the total gravitational energy released and escape. And that's what is a supernova explosion. And... Uh, as Zwicky and Bade had predicted, such a supernova explosion would be associated with a neutron star at the core, and the supernova will also uh, result in cosmic ray production, as I was uh, discussing. Uh, please go through the very nice and short article by Adam S. Burroughs given in this link, and there he mentions that how it was not Landau who talked about neutron stars, but it was Bade and Zwicky, they predicted uh, neutron stars. And of course, pulsars were discovered in around 1968, 1969, and Bade and Zwicky were vindicated. What Landau had talked about is a star-like giant nucleus with protons and neutrons, both, not purely uh, neutrons. In fact, Adam S. Burroughs mentions that uh, when Landau uh, worked out this giant nucleus, neutrons were not even discovered. Although when the paper was published, by then neutrons were discovered. So please go through this. Very simple uh, article, short and simple article. And here are the supernova explosion images, 1987A supernova explosion. Shell, the core uh, is here and the shell expanding because of the explosion. And here is a magnified version of the core region, this is the shell. This is a crab supernova remnant, and at the center there is a, a pulsar. Obviously, it's called crab pulsar. And here is the Kepler supernova remnant, which exploded in the year 1604. And this is a artist's vision of a fast 
rotating neutron star with a magnetic dipole moment whose dipole moment axis makes an angle with the spin axis and because the magnetic field is very high and uh, the rotation rate is also very high so the magnetic field as seen by an observer outside is changing very rapidly and because of this the observer outside will see a very strong electric field field that pulls out the electrons from the surface of the neutron stars and accelerate them and the accelerated neutrons will move along the field lines and radiate and those radiation are going to be observed as pulses so trap pulsar is a double pulsed uh, object while vela pulsar is a single pulsed uh, observed pulsar and as you can see the trap pulsar can be seen in radio optical x rays gamma rays similarly pulsar 1509 58 can be seen in radio op optical it doesn't have any pulse but x ray as well as gamma ray while vela pulsar can be seen in all three four bands radio optical x ray gamma ray but most of the pulsars which are discovered are shining in radio that means in every 0 to 2 pi phase their pulses are seen in the radio remember these figures are in a when the pulsar makes a full rotation from 0 to 2 pi angle so it will repeat these pulses keep repeating in other words pulsars are the most accurate clocks in the universe because their pulse shape they keep repeating after every rotational period of the neutron star and because the magnetic uh, dipole moment associated with the neutron star makes an angle with the rotation axis so we will see the pulse only for line of sight intersects with this cone over which electrons that are getting accelerated radiate uh, electromagnetic waves i'll skip this slide and this is an actual x-ray image of the crab pulsar this is an image taken by the x-ray telescope named after s chandrashekar called chandra x-ray observatory and you can already see evidence of past rotation so imagine the theoretical picture that emerged around 1967 due to pacini then carried off uh, by physicists like thomas gold julian goldreich hoyl narlikar and also had done some work concerning the rotating neutron star and so the theoretical model that pulsars are due to rotating neutron stars are indeed vindicated by the chandra x-ray image of this trap pulsar and this is the chandra x-ray image of the vela pulsar again you can see the evidence in the x-ray image of rotation and the axis of rotation i'll skip this slide and then uh, around 1999 a new class of highly magnetized neutron stars were discovered they are called magnetars and magnetars they flare up time to time in x rays and there is a, a repetition also in the x ray pulsation and uh, it was discovered that these x-ray pulsation arise due to 
very high magnetic field, magnetic field greater than 10 to the power 14 Gauss. So normal pulsars have magnetic field uh, up to 10 to the power 14 Gauss, while magnetars are those neutron stars whose magnetic field is greater than 10 to the power 14 Gauss. So they are uh, very fascinating objects and maybe uh, they may be the cause of a new class of objects that were discovered called fast radio bursts. So all these uh, neutron stars are rich in their astrophysical content and may explain uh, objects like fast radio burst and as well as perhaps gamma ray bursts. Okay, now I will talk about Saha and his equation, but uh, probably uh, you might be having some questions. Uh, you can, if you have any doubt, you can ask now. Whatever I have discussed so far. Are there any questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, then I will carry on with my slides. So, Meghnath Saha, one of the outstanding astrophysicists, born in the year 1893, and uh, he passed away in 1956. Here is the picture of Meghnath Saha, with his cyclotron Ds. As you know, Meghnath Sa established the first cyclotron, which is an accelerator where charged particles go from one D to another D in a periodic fashion and they get accelerated and they are confined to the D by a magnetic field perpendicular to the Ds. And uh, Meghnath Sa, his career, is very interesting. He started as a theoretical physicist, but then moved over to experimental nuclear physics. Here is Meghnath Sa as a young man in 1919. And in 1919, when he was teaching in uh, the science college Kolkata, he used for the first time quantum theory uh, to explain selective radiation pressure uh, on matter outside a star. All right. And uh, there's an interesting piece of work per se. Basically what he used is the quantum theory of atoms. As you know, atoms are essentially a dense nucleus with protons and neutrons and a cloud of electrons around the nucleus and the energy levels of the electrons are quantized because of quantum mechanics. They have a ground state energy level first excited state, and so on. Of course, this is only a pictorial. It's not that electrons are going around in orbits. Rather, ground state is associated with a cloud-like wave function. So is the first excited state, and so on. And quantum theory explained the discrete line element, uh, line emission from elements 
and no no that problem has been sorted out that problem has been sorted out and uh, essentially when you pass the radiation coming from excited atoms you see discrete lines and quantum theory explains them by saying that lines are emitted when an electron jumps from one discrete energy level to another so if you have a lower level and a higher level then the atom can absorb energy a photon can be absorbed and the electron will go from the lower level to the higher level or if the atoms are already in a excited state when the electron comes down from a an excited level to a lower level it emits a photon there can be also a fascinating thing called stimulated emission which leads to laser i'll not talk about uh, stimulated emission now so in other words the entire spectroscopy that radiation from elements like hydrogen sodium chlorine etc mercury when you excite them and take the radiation pass through either a prism or a diffraction grating what you see are discrete lines and it is the observation of discrete lines that gave birth to discrete energy level of uh, atoms and it led to quantum mechanics led to schrodinger equation and so on now what happened was uh, many astronomers and culminating with fraunhofer what they discovered by looking at the spectroscopy of the sun light and also light from other stars that apart from the continuum because the photosphere of the star like sun they radiate like black body and therefore there is of course continuous emission but they also saw absorption lines dark lines as you can see these dark lines are lines where no photons are being absorbed and the interpretation therefore would be that the radiation from the continuum part they get absorbed because of elements present in the cooler region above the photosphere and why such absorption lines will be present and details of the intensity of the absorption lines they were very puzzling till saha arrived in the scene and explained them using an equation which today is called the saha equation and those who are interested in the historical aspects of these absorption lines from emerging from the environment near the stars as well as uh, the history of how saha's ionization equation uh, came about uh, please go through this link uh, link is this the article by professor arnab rai choudhury it's a very uh, pedagogical and simply written article you can see the history of fraunhofer lines as well as uh, the history of how the saha equation was derived and uh, just let me flash the saha equation uh, we don't have to bother about the derivation here what saha established was that you could have elements in different degree of ionization so imagine that nn is the number density of neutral atoms 
while Ni is for the same element, the number density of ions, then Saha established that for such a mixture of ions and neutral atoms held at a temperature T, the ratio of ions to the neutral atoms is given by this equation where T is the temperature, Kb is the Boltzmann constant, con constant and Ui is the energy required to obtain the ionized state from the neutral level because if you were ionized meaning what? You have to throw away electrons from the neutral atoms. Only then the after throwing away the electrons or ejecting the electrons away, what you are left with a is a effectively positively charged uh, ion and you can throw away one electron, you can throw away two electrons and as many, but you will require the some amount of energy to eject one electron, some amount of energy to eject another electron and so on. And you can therefore estimate the ratio of an element at various ionized state. This ratio can be obtained from the Saha equation. Okay. And those who are interested can uh, study more on Saha equation. I must uh, tell you one interesting uh, coincidence. This year is the centenary year of the discovery of Saha's ionization equation. Saha published a series of papers uh, devoted to the ionization equation in the year 1920. Right. Now, of course, you can ask, stellar lines are fine. What about galaxies? We had talked about uh, galaxies being gravitationally bound system of stars, gaseous matter, dark matter and so on. If you look at a galaxy, the stellar matter in the galaxy will show up in emission lines. Gaseous matter, cold gas will show up in absorption lines, while hot gas of course will show up in emission lines. Here is a spectrum of a galaxy called NGC 1832 and this galaxy is a barred spiral of the B type. We have talked about various kinds of spiral galaxies. I will soon show you uh, that Hubble classification of galaxies once again. But here you can see that here you have a singly ionized oxygen. That's why oxygen 2. Oxygen 1 will be a neutral oxygen. Oxygen 2 is a singly ionized oxygen. Here is the uh, hydrogen emission lines, various Bummer lines, Lyman lines. Here is a Lyman line, H alpha, the Lyman line of hydrogen. As you can see, such a intense line because hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. Then you have Barmer lines and so on. You also see doubly ionized oxygen here, then doubly ionized, sorry, singly ionized sulfur emission line. You can also see absorption line due to H gamma. Here are some absorption lines and so on. Remember, to make out what is the density of gas etc. in a galaxy, what are the temperature condition, you need to therefore use Saha ionization equation. So Saha ionization equation, in fact, is credited to be one equation which brought about a revolution in understanding the astrophysical conditions in various cosmic objects. Only by using Saha Saha's ionization equation and the observed data 
you can estimate the number density of various elements their ionized states etc in far away galaxies all right so this graph is a plot of intensity of the radiation seen from this galaxy as a function of wavelength here the wavelength is measured in units of angstrom as you know the angstrom unit is related to nanometer in the following way 1 nanometer is 10 angstroms okay so 4000 angstrom would mean 400 nanometers while 6000 angstrom will mean 600 nanometers 1 nanometer is 10 to the power minus 9 meters okay right and as i said that ngc 1832 is a barred spiral galaxy of b type let us refer to the uh, hubble classification of galaxies barred spiral galaxy of b type is this there'll be a spiral arm and there is a barred structure at the nucleus region of course there are many kinds of galaxies here there is a regular spiral galaxy no bar but a spheroidal bulge and spiral arms here is another spiral galaxy with many spiral arms here is the m87 elliptical galaxy with a jet as you know m87 recently made news because the event horizon telescope sort of map the shadow of the black hole at the center supermassive black hole at the center of this m87 galaxy here is another elliptical galaxy called sombrero galaxy sombrero because it looks like a mexican hat here is a comparative size of different galaxy the m87 as you can see is so huge compared to andromeda which is a spiral galaxy milky way is here the whirlpool galaxy which presents its face to us uh these are of course drawn using artist imagination based on astronomical data uh, it appears today that milky way galaxy may not be smaller in size compared to andromeda galaxy milky way galaxy probably is either uh, bigger in size or comparable to andromeda galaxy here is a spectrum of a quasar you can see very bright emission lines from a quasar as a function of wavelength and in particular you can see uv lines strong uv lines in the quasar spectrum as you know quasar if you observe it with a telescope it appears like a star it will appears like a point source but with intense emission you can see here the lyman alpha due to hydrogen at the wavelength 1216 angstrom or 121.6 nanometer then you can see various ionized lines silicon third level ionized silicon third level ionized carbon second ionized carbon first ionized magnesium and so on and again to understand the condition temperature number density of elements one needs to use sahas ionization equation and a quasar as i said quasar appears if you observe it with optical telescope it appears as a star but actually it is nothing but a nuclear region of a galaxy the galaxy is not seen because a nuclear region itself radiates 
much more energy compared to the rest of the galaxy. So many quasars also emit radiation in uh, radio wavelength. As you can see, that this particular radio source, the nuclear region has a supermassive black hole and you can go at higher resolution and you can see a jet of radio wave coming out. Here is another uh, elliptical galaxy NGC 4261 where the quasar is at the nuclear region of this elliptical galaxy from which large scale radio jets are coming out. Hubble Space Telescope has mapped the nuclear region of this galaxy and you can see dust lane, bright emission forming a disk-like structure. There is a, the supermassive black hole is right at the center. You can't even resolve it. And as you can see here, the resolution is one arc second. So much is the resolution. Remember, what is arc second? Note that pi radian, pi is, which is a rational number approximated as 22 divided by 7, pi radians correspond to 180 degrees. One degree corresponds to 60 arc minute. One arc minute corresponds to 60 arc second. So in other words, when you convert, whenever you are given a problem where the angle is given in terms of arc seconds or arc minutes and so on, in order to use those angle as sign of something, you have to convert it into radian first. So the conversion is as follows, pi radian, which is 180 degrees. So one degree is pi, pi is approximated as 22 by 7. So one degree is 22 by 7 into 180. So that is what is one degree. But one degree is 60 arc minute and one arc minute 60 arc second. In other words, one degree is 3600 arc second. So some of you in one of the problem where I had given arc second have uh, done some mistakes in the numerical factor. So please note that whenever you want to manipulate using data concerning angles, you have to be a little bit careful because you have to first convert everything into radians. So remember the conversion. One arc minute is one arc second. One degree is 60 arc minutes. And one degree is 22 divided by 7 into 180 radians. All right. These are very important uh, classifications required in the field of astronomy. And in particular, in this picture, this, this scale is correspond to one arc second. And that is the resolution of, uh, I mean, you can see how, how powerful is the resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope. And the reason why you have the so-called radio jets and the quasar-like phenomena is because there is a black, black hole and plasma is hot plasma is rotating around the black hole. This is just for the completeness sake. Don't worry. These are, uh, we are not going to look at the details of this. So the Hubble Space Telescope image of the central region is the black hole can't be even resolved. There is a accretion disk which is shining bright at the center and black hole is somewhere there, a black dot. Can't even be resolved. 
Now, astronomers, of course, keep looking at different galaxies. They see a large scale structure which are mapped out by different galaxies. You can see that galaxies and the clusters of galaxies forming filaments, forming voids, and so on. But what can we say about the overall distribution of the galaxies? What are their dynamics? Or in short, how does universe evolve with time? The entire subject of cosmology is a subfield of physics and cosmology is a study of the origin, evolution, and composition of the universe on very large scales. Large scales meaning scales of the order of 100 megaparsec or above. Remember, 1 megaparsec is 1 million parsec. 1 parsec is about 3.26 light years. Or 1 parsec is also 3 into 10 to 18 centimeters. So, in other words, cosmology is a subfield of physics that deals with the origin, evolution, and the composition of universe. And composition and evolution of the universe pertains to scales bigger than 100 megaparsecs. All right. Now, the theoretical physicist from Newton onwards, they made theoretical ideas regarding what our universe is like. Newton, Einstein, and as you know, we talked about Olber's paradox. People like Kepler, Laplace, Le Chatux, they were always interested in applying the laws of physics that we discover in our laboratories to the entire universe as a whole. But the real observational evidence concerning the universe as a whole came when Edwin Hubble, an American astronomer, he tried to find out the distances of different galaxies and looked at the line emission coming from galaxies. As we, we just saw that if you pass the light from galaxies and pass the light through a prism or diffraction grating, you see discrete features and the line emissions, whether absorption or uh, emission lines, one can use Saha equation to talk a great deal about the line emissions and the physical conditions uh, present. What are the ionized elements present in different galaxies? Now note the distance measurement that Hubble did. So this is a cartoon of what Hubble had done. Hubble had measured the distances of several galaxies in the axis, x-axis, one is plotting the distance in units of megaparsec of different galaxies. And in the y-axis, one is presenting the rate at which these galaxies are moving away from us. Now you might ask, how do we obtain the rate at which galaxies are moving away from us? Here, one must be told about something called Doppler shift. Although in reality, the shift that Hubble measured is not Doppler shift. But nevertheless, Hubble thought that the shift in the emission lines 
is arising due to the recession velocities of these galaxies and he gave rise to a model of a universe that was born from a very dense state today we look at it from general theory of relativity perspective but let's not go into those theoretical ideas but nevertheless the idea that a source which is radiating the emission lines or the absorption lines can be shifted as a function of wavelength can be understood even using doppler shift we will not give quantitative ideas regarding doppler shift i will just explain using an analogy those who have traveled in train and have visited railway stations they must have experienced this that when a train is approaching the railway station and it sounds out whistle then when the train is moving fast and approaching the station the whistle the pitch of the whistle is shriller than when the train is leaving the station moving away with great speed and sounds out a whistle in the second case the whistle's pitch is much lower that means when the whistle is sounded when the train is approaching the frequency of the whistle is larger than the whistle's uh, frequency when the train is leaving the platform and the reason is doppler shift because one can show that for newtonian velocities the observed frequency is the frequency emitted in the rest frame multiplied by 1 plus speed of the source divided by c this is just a newtonian calculation if you do a more accurate calculation using relativity you will get get also another factor of the lorentz gamma factor but anyway don't have to go into these details all i am saying is that the spectral lines the wavelength that the astronomers measure on earth even if there is a ionized system of hydrogen gas the observed lines that one sees of these iron emission lines or absorption lines emerging from a distant galaxy the lines are not seen at what you expect them to be rather the wavelength of these lines seem to be longer and then astronomers like humes on hubble they figured out these lines are shifted and they thought that because the galaxies most of the galaxies are moving away that's why the wavelengths are shifted to the longer wavelength side of course some wave nearby galaxies you can see the recession velocity is are negative recession velocity positive meaning they are moving away negative meaning they are moving towards us for example andromeda galaxy is moving towards us so the emission lines will be doppler blue shifted while the galaxies further away they are having doppler shift whereby the and what hubble did was he measured the distance of these galaxies remember how did he measure the distance i talked about uh, enrietta one of the lady astronomers enrietta levitt who found out a very interesting correlation between the luminosity of a cepheid variable and the period which which the luminosity fluctuate she found a correlation between luminosity and the period over which the cepheid variables fluctuate 
and because the period can be measured and therefore you could ascertain the luminosity and knowing the luminosity and measuring the flux one gets a distance and hubble used the cepheid variables to estimate the distance of these galaxies and by then of course the other debate there was a debate whether andromeda and other nebula like objects are within our galaxies or they are away from our galaxy the so called shapley curtis debate shapley believed that these objects were part of our galaxy while the younger astronomer curtis he debated that they are further away from our milky way galaxy they are not part of the milky way galaxy and finally it was using the cepheid variable using the distance estimate used by making use of the cepheid variable the verdict went in favor of curtis indeed it was found that these nebulae are not galactic nebulae but they were independent galaxies and here i must mention the philosopher german philosopher immanuel kant when he had uh, seen this nebulae he actually thought of them as island universes separate universe by themselves and looks like he was closer to the truth although he just made a guess while curtis was correct based on his uh, analysis on data and hubble analysis showed that these were indeed galaxies by themselves which were being observed but hubble went one step ahead of people like humezon slipher etc he plotted the correlation between the shift he interpreted them as doppler shift and he <coughs> plotted the inferred recession velocities of these galaxies as a function of the distance of the galaxies and he found a scattered plot and whenever you see such scattered plot which is almost linear you will try to make a best fit and hubble fitted the plot using a straight line and he gave the fit as velocity as a function of distance and he gave the relation v is equal to some constant times t this constant h not is what today we call as hubble parameter to give tribute to edwin hubble's work so this is called the hubble law which says that that further away a galaxy is hubble interpreted that it is moving faster so higher is the distance greater is the recession velocity of a galaxy for example if it is a if it is at a 2 megaparsec distance its velocity is close to 1000 kilometers per second while if it is at a 1 megaparsec distance its velocity is somewhat lower than 500 kilometers per second hubble interpreted so hubble of course not only really was a good astronomer he had good brain to conclude what could be a simple model to explain such correlation so what he suggested is that look at this higher the larger is the distance higher is the velocity hubble simple a simplified interpretation is that if universe was born in an explosion where galaxies were thrown out with different velocities higher is a galactic velocity today they would have gone further away if the velocity is very high today they would have reached a larger distance compared to a galaxy which was ejected 
with a smaller velocity. So that will naturally produce <coughs> such a linear correlation. Of course, remember, I mean, it's a very simple model. You are neglecting gravitational att attraction between galaxies and so on. But a simple picture that universe was born through an explosion where galaxies were thrown out with different velocities. Larger the velocity, today they will be at a larger distance. Smaller the velocity, they'll be at a smaller distance. Could, in a very simple manner, explain what was being observed. But as I said, that this naive idea is not correct because sometimes you shift that is measured is so high that if you assume that it is Doppler uh, shift, then the galaxies have to be moving with relativistic velocity. And that is very unlikely because a relativistically moving galaxy with respect to intergalactic medium will produce all kind of other radiation which you don't see. <clears throat> so true interpretation for the Hubble observation is an expanding universe which follows from theoretical general relativistic calculation. As I had already mentioned, before Hubble observed the recession velocities and distance correlation, in 1922, Friedman, he, using general relativity, had already obtained both expanding and contracting solution. And independently, somewhat later, uh, a bishop, Belgian bishop called Le Maitre, George Le Maitre, he also similarly, using general relativity and the assumption of homogeneous and isotropic distribution of matter, he had also shown that you could have expanding or contracting solution, but he claimed that our universe was indeed expanding. Meaning what? That the points between Different points in the universe, as time goes on, the distance between the points is increasing with time. It's not that galaxies are moving with great velocity, but the distance between galaxies is increasing with time, the so-called expanding model of the universe. Now remember, Lemaitre's model that universe expanding was few years before Hubble actually gave a model based on actual observation. So indeed, today, I mean, earlier people had not uh, realized that George Lemaitre had already predicted an expanding model emerging from general relativity because his publications were in the obscure Belgian journals and uh, therefore uh, the rest of the astronomer and astrophysics community, they had not read those papers. But today, of course, everyone acknowledges that Lemaitre and Friedman they had done pioneering work, theoretical work, before the observational evidence on an expanding university. In other words, this model suggests that if you go back in the past, the galaxies with the distance between them was shorter. In fact, if you go back, they will all get overlapped. They will become gaseous. If you go back further, the gas will become very dense and hot. They'll be ionized. In other words, if you still go back to about 13.8 billion years back, the universe was almost infinitely dense and infinitely hot, the so-called Big Bang singularity. But remember that everything is homogeneous and isotropic. It's not that 
universe emerged from a single point, physical, single spatial point. Rather, a better analogy is an analogy that supposing our space was two-dimensional, suppose our space is two-dimensional, and you can think of the two-dimensional space as a closed surface of a balloon, and on the balloon you draw dots representing galax galaxies, and that if you fill more and more air into the balloon, the balloon will expand, but the dots themselves will not expand. These are dots, don't worry about the size, these are dots. So the dots are like galaxies, but because the balloon is expanding, the distance between the dots are increasing, and so on. And that is what is a better analogy for the expanding universe. Of course, such a model where space is a closed two-dimensional surface is only one of the possibilities. Our universe, which has three space dimension and one time, the so-called friedman lemaitre model has three different things. One is the closed model, of course, but there is also infinitely, spatially infinite model for k equal to 0 and k equal to minus 1. But don't uh, worry about the details. At the moment, just uh, trust my words that the universe is homogeneous, like every point on the surface of the balloon is of the same kind. And similarly, there's no preferred direction. So the universe is isotropic and homogeneous. And it's a Copernican point of view of expansion, where if you are in this galaxy, you will see that all other galaxies are receding away from you. But so would be your alien friend. If you are in an alien galaxy, you'll also see the other galaxies are expanding away from you. Imagine just the observation of shifts of the emission lines and the distance of galaxies gave such a great evidence for the expanding model. And uh, so we have indeed an expanding universe. Let's go into. In other words, what we are saying is in the past, there were no galaxies, just gaseous clouds expanding away. Then slowly, due to dark matter, gaseous clouds give rise to galaxies. And today, we are having rich galaxies and galaxies having solar systems where planets with life can form. And the test in cosmology is that today we are here, spiral galaxies, huge elliptical galaxies. And one is trying to exp explain today how interplay of the dark matter and the baryonic matter like hydrogen, helium, etc., falling in the deep wells of the dark matter gave rise to galaxies. Even further away, how the Big Bang at a very large density and temperature, how it evolved, and that is the subject of cosmology. And uh, there are a lot of interesting questions like, what are these dark matter? And uh, not only dark matter, today we know that the distance between galaxies is not only increasing, but the rate at which the distance between galaxies is increasing itself is becoming more and more. That means the galaxies are moving away apart as though there is some repulsive gravitational field. And what can cause such a repulsive gravity? That source is termed as a dark energy. Dark energy is some hypothetical matter which is causing 
repulsive gravity. On the other hand, dark matter is also an hypothetical matter which always has attractive gravity. Both are dark because they don't interact with light. And in today's uh, cosmology, what is dark matter, how they influence the structure of large scale structure of the universe, what is dark energy, these are burning questions which cosmologists are trying to answer. Of course, the very beginning of what happened in the Big Bang, that is the field in which quantum gravity and string theory will play a very important role. And indeed, the vast area of research concerning early universe and cosmology is a uh, very exciting field and a lot of active research is going on. I'll stop here and if there are any questions, I will answer. Shivangi is asking, is the ionization energy required decreases with rising temperature? That is not true. As Let me go to the um, slide. Ionization energy UI here is given by the energy levels of ions, ions, neutral atoms and so on, is the energy levels which decide what the ionization energy is. For example, if you take the hydrogen atom, hydrogen atom has only one electron and one proton. And what is the ionization energy? What is the energy that you need to supply in order to make the hydrogen atom unbound? That means take away the electron. The minimum energy you require is, is 13.6 electron volt. Why? Because the ground state energy level of an electron in a hydrogen atom is minus 13.6 electron volt. So therefore, in order to take away the electron to infinity, that means the bare minimum that you need is when the electron goes to infinity and is at rest, its energy must be zero. So therefore, you have to, the minimum energy that you need to supply is 13.6 electron volt to ionize a hydrogen atom. So in the case of hydrogen element, Ui is fixed. Ui will be 13.6 electron volt. But the temperature also decides what is the fraction of ionized hydrogen to neutral hydrogen. As you can see, if temperature goes very high, the exponential factor minus 13 e raised to power 13.6 electron volt divided by kBT, if the temperature is higher, <clears throat> the expo exponent is less negative and therefore you will get higher Ni by Nn. There is of course T raised to power 3 by 2. So more is the temperature, higher will be the fraction of ionized hydrogen to neutral hydrogen. Similarly for the other elements also, if you know the ionization energy that comes from quantum mechanical calculation. When you did your quantum mechanics course, you must have also estimated the binding energy or ionization energy for the helium using the variational method of quantum mechanics. And so it is the atomic and molecular physics research that will tell us about the ionization energy and then using Saha equation, we can estimate the fraction of ionized element to the corresponding neutral element.
The day she's asking, no, no, uh, uh, well, uh, what you have stated, Dinesh, is a little bit confusing. Let me tell you what is the correct statement. If you look at the energy of a particle in the expanding universe, you'll find that as the universe expands, the energy of the particle in this universe keeps decreasing. And that is the reason why a photon emitted from a galaxy very far away by the time it reaches us, because by the time it has reaches, reached us, universe has expanded and therefore the photon's energy has gone down. And that is the reason why the wavelength is shifted. Now you might ask, why is the energy of a particle when the universe is expanding is decreasing? The real answer comes from the general relativistic model of the expanding universe. But I can give you a Newtonian way of seeing why this should happen. So imagine that the universe is like a gaseous cloud and different particles in this cloud have different energy and because it's a gaseous cloud it also has a gravitational potential energy of the order of minus gm square by r but if the cloud expands r is increasing so therefore minus gm square by r is actually increasing but where is the increase coming from? Total energy must be conserved. The increase must come from the kinetic energy decreasing. So that is the reason why when the universe expands, because gravitational potential energy increases, the kinetic energy decreases. And that's the reason why the particle's kinetic energy keeps falling as the universe expands. A photon, therefore, its kinetic energy falls and thereby h nu, E equal to h nu is a kinetic energy. If h nu decreases, wavelength increases. And that's the reason why Hubble saw a correlation between longer wavelength and large distances of the galaxy. By the way, uh, all of you uh, must solve the second internal uh, second assignment set that I have sent to you. So far, I have received only one by Anil Sharma. I have received the uh, set. They are very simple problems. Uh, Shivangi, the date for the internal assessment will be decided by the executive committee. And recently, there was a meeting of executive committee. They have not yet told us what is the date of the internal assessment. By the way, uh, the second set of two lectures, uh, I am a bit uh, busy in the afternoon today and also in the morning. If you wish, we can have the second uh, two hours of lecture tomorrow at 4.30, if it is agreeable to you. And probably what we should do is that uh, we, uh, we can have some kind of a tutorial session uh, tomorrow at 4.30, if all of you are willing, where uh, you can uh, clear your doubts because so far it is going one way. I am just speaking showing slide, but I want to have the next uh, two hours of session uh, where you ask your doubts, whether you have some difficulty, because soon there'll be internal assessment exam. And I want that we devote the next two hours uh, clearing the difficulty.
Are there any other question? So, uh, tomorrow's afternoon session, we will, I will organize it as a Google Meet because there will be questions. It will not be of the StreamYard uh, format where it gets recorded automatically because it's clearing of doubts. Uh, so, we will have it as a Google Meet. Okay. So I urge all the students who are crediting this course to be present tomorrow uh, for the Google Meet, meet at 4.30. All right, if there are no more questions, I will end the session for today. I see that Devendar has mentioned that uh, internal for open book exam will be on 7th uh, November. All right. 7th November is not very far away. So, therefore, uh, we should, we should uh, have tomorrow a clearing of doubt session. Okay. So, in other words, this means that if 7th of November is the internal um, exam, then we cannot have our lecture next week on Saturday. It will be essentially exam. All right. So if there are no more questions, I will end this uh, session for today. We will meet again tomorrow at 4.30. So take care and goodbye.